Okay, this is just a quick review of Unit 1, um, which is on statistical analysis. I'm going to be using this presentation, um, which is online, and it's from one of the sites that I have linked from my Blackboard site because I think it's one of the best. Okay, so some things that you're supposed to remember from this unit. Okay, you need to know how to calculate a mean. Okay, and you need to know um, what error bars are. Right, remember that's one of your... Um, command terms and assessments is to state that error bars are graphical representations of the variability of data. Okay, and so when we look at this data set, okay, we can see from this graph, okay, A has the largest mean, B has a lower mean, and that B has a higher degree of variability because it has a larger standard deviation. So what we say when we look at data like this is that a set A because it has a lower standard deviation we can be more confident in that data and that data set B has more variability in the data. Okay, um, I'm just going to click through some of this. So basically in this presentation he's using hummingbirds as an example throughout so that we can keep looking at the hummingbirds. Okay, remember one of the things we did in the uncertainty lab is to measure uncertainty um, which is the error from our measurement tools, okay? And remember that we're going to use this here, which says that you're going to use half of the smallest measured division to calculate your, um, your plus or minus here. So in this ruler, what's kind of interesting, when they're measuring the hummingbird, they're saying um, here they're measuring it's 26 millimeters, plus or minus 1. Now half would have been plus or minus 0.5, but they're saying because there would be plus or minus 0.5 on this end and plus or minus 0.5 on that end. We won't have to worry about that on your quiz. Just remember half of the smallest unit of measure. Okay, um, we will not be doing Excel um, on the test, but remember you do need to know how to do all of this for your IAs. So I'm just going to click through this. Okay, so when you're looking at it graphically, again, same thing here. When you calculate the mean, okay, on a normal distribution curve, that's the X with the line over it, okay, and then we see that the standard deviation in this graph, right, has a, a lower standard deviation, which means we can be more confident in this data, whereas this graph over here shows that the um, that there's a higher standard deviation and that the so that means the data is more variable and more spread out. Okay. So again, what else do you need to know for the test? Okay. Is that most of the data falls within 68% is sorry, 68 of the percent of the data will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. Okay? And that 95% of the of the data points lie within two standard deviations of the mean. You have to remember those numbers. Okay, so here's a good question, practice question. A set of length measurements are taken with a mean of 2.5 and a standard deviation of 0.5. Which of the following statements is true? A, 68% of all the data lie within 2.5 and 3.5. All right, I'm not going to read them all. You can read them. Do you have your answer picked? Okay, let's check it out. The correct answer is C. So if the standard deviation is 0.5, two standard deviations would be 1. So plus or minus 1 of 2.5 would give you 3.5. And minus 1 from 2.5 is 1.5. So that's two standard deviations, which gives us 95% of all the data points should lie within those two standard deviations. Okay, if you can use a calculator for all of this or Excel. And Okay, so really important. Okay, it's once you have your data graphed, okay, what does it tell us? Okay, when you have s your error bars overlapping each other, Okay, that means that there's not likely to be a significant difference between the two data sets. Okay, but if there's no overlap between your two data sets, then it is likely that there's a significant difference. 
again, we would rather use something like a t-test now to give us that 95% confidence. So we can say based on this data that 95% of the data points, if they're um, not overlapping, then it's, pro it's most likely a significant difference. But again, using a t-test is going to be a better way to actually give us those numbers. Okay, another way of looking at it, okay, if the data points overlap, okay, then there's not likely a difference, a significant difference. And if there's a, only a teeny tiny bit, a small amount of overlap, then there's likely to be a significant difference. Okay, so which data set has a higher range? See, I don't know if it gives us the answers. Oh, it does. Okay, so B, right, higher range, greater standard deviation set B. More precise results, okay, probably set A because it has a smaller standard deviation. Higher mean, okay, well, if we were looking at the numbers at the bottom, right, there would be numbers down here. This would have a higher mean, okay, and higher frequency at the mean, meaning more data sets at its mean, would be A. Okay, t-test is really important. This is what's going to actually give us the confidence to say whether there's significant difference between the means of two different populations. Okay, so let's just see. Okay, remember a null hypothesis? you're going to have to write one on the test. So a null hypothesis, you're saying that there's no significant difference between whatever the data sets are that you're testing. Okay, and we're looking to get 95% confidence, okay, which means the p-value is going to be um, less than 0.05. Okay, so remember when you're using your data table, you're looking for the 0.05, which is 95% confidence. This is saying P, remember, is the probability that the cause for the difference in the data sets is just due to chance, and we want that to be less than 5%. Okay, again, you have to calculate your degrees of freedom, so you add up your total sample size, and then you subtract 2. Okay, and then you're going to look up your values from the table. So if you had a data set with um, 11 samples, so you do 11 minus 9, okay, and then at 95% confidence or where their p-value is 0.05, right, you'd come and look and you'd get 1.833 and you'd have to use that to compare with the, your calculated value. Okay, so again, back to the hummingbirds. Okay, there was 12 red throat and 13 broad build and we're saying that there's going to be no significant difference is our null hypothesis between the two groups, okay. Our degrees of freedom then is the 12 plus the 13 minus the 2 is 23. So we'd find 23 on the chart. We're always going with 0 0.05 because that's our minimum that we have to have confidence to get 95% confidence. Okay, and then the critical value is 1.714. And then, so they're already telling us, they already did all the data calculations. So 2.15 was the T calculated value. Because it is greater, then 1.714, you can reject the null hypothesis. So when you reject the null, then you're saying that there is a significant difference between the red throats and the broad-billed wingspan. Okay? Again, if your T value that you calculated is less than the calculated value from the table, then you have to accept the null hypothesis which says that there is no significant difference. Okay. All right, the last thing that we did not talk about in class is correlation versus causation. Okay, so we can look at correlations. We can calculate, again, using Excel, you could calculate a correlation where here you're looking at bill length versus weight, okay? So as the bill length increases, so does the weight. So there's a correlation, okay, 0 0.92, okay, means that it's a high correlation. Basically, you're approaching the number one is a perfectly correlated um, number, or a negative correlation, which means as one increases, the other decreases. 
Okay. If your correlation, if your R value is a zero, that means there's no correlation between the data sets. Okay. So if we look, if our data sets, again, one's increasing, the other's increasing, that's called a strong positive. One's increasing while the other one's decreasing, that's a strong negative correlation. If the data points are all just really dispersed, okay, then that's no correlation. You'd have a zero figure. Okay, so this again, the R value here would be close to 1, here it would be close to negative 1, here it would be close to 0, and then this would be, you know, maybe like a, a point 0.6 or something where it's going to be, you know, a close to 1 but not, not that strong. So this is again just showing strong would be 0.92, that's a strong correlation. Okay, point one, no correlation that, you know, it's n there's no relationship between the data. And then a negative data correlation just means that there is a correlation, but that it's a negatively associated one. Okay, but here's the most important part, okay, that we didn't talk about and people were confused in their homework. Correlation does not prove causality. Okay, just because there's a relationship between two data points or two sets of data does not mean that one caused the other. Okay, for example, look at this really silly one over here. It's kind of hard to see, but this is number of pirates and global temperature. Is there a correlation? Sure, it looks like, you know, as the number of pirates is decreasing, the global temperature is increasing. But do you really think that the number of pirates is affecting the global temperature? No. Okay. So correlations can show relationships between two data sets. Okay. But you must you must use a test. A you must design an experiment to prove to prove causality. Okay, so again, you would have had to set up your experiment with the, the birds or whatever it is that you're testing and set up an experiment that can prove the cause. Okay, so temperature and enzyme activity. As the temperature increases, the enzyme activity increases because temperature causes enzyme activity to increase. That can be proved with an experiment that there's a cause and effect. Okay. Otherwise, you just have you can say that there's a correlation, positive or negative, but you can't say there's a cause unless you've done an experiment to test it. Okay. Again, highly recommend you do the questions at the end of the chapter, page 12, 13, 14, 15. There's sample questions. I highly recommend that you check them out.